Welcome to the Willow Oak Value Hour. I'm Keith Smith, a portfolio manager of one of the Willow Oak affiliated funds, Bonhoeffer Fund, and I have with me today Jamie Catherwood, the financial history guy on Twitter. His background is he's he's really done a, a great job of bringing a lot of financial history to light. He's got a, a newsletter, Convault Investor Amnesia, as you see here, and really digs into history. He's done some really good research himself and also highlighted a lot of other folks that have done some really great financial history. As an investor, I found the presentations very, very useful. In addition, for our shareholders, for the Bonhoeffer Fund shareholders, we're going to be providing you a free access to, to the course that Jamie has put together, which has some really great historians and provides some really good information in regards to history, some examples, and how you really can use history as part of your investment process. We're going to get a little bit more into that into some of the question and answer. But I thought I would just start out here with uh, with Jamie, just maybe a little bit of his background, and then in addition, some introductory presentation here that really talks about some of the financial themes in history. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, again for having me, Keith. It's a pleasure to be here and always great to chat with you. As you alluded to, I am a definitely registered financial history nerd. And the kind of way that happened was I was a history major. I went to King's College London. And history has always been my passion from when I was young. And when I was in college, I started getting interested more in markets and finance and investing. And when I graduated, I was definitely prone to networking and stuff on LinkedIn and trying to do that. Quickly discovered that LinkedIn is a kind of a cesspool and it's not a place you want to spend a lot of time. It's a pretty cringy. But I had a friend who told me, hey, you should try and do network and post stuff on Twitter. And so I started doing that, even though I didn't believe him at first, but I quickly realized there's a lot of smart people on there. That's how we connected, for example. Yeah. And I saw that there were a bunch of people posting blogs, podcasts, et cetera, about finance, but that there was no one focusing solely on history. And so I missed the kind of research and writing process because I didn't have a reason to really keep it up after college. And so I thought, you know, maybe I'll do a four or five part article series on some interesting moments in financial and economic history, not expecting really anyone to read it, but it was more just, I missed the writing process and wanted to flex that muscle again. And to my complete shock and surprise, after the first article I posted went live, it kind of blew up a bit, much more than I expected. And I quickly realized that most people have some interest in history. I think everyone has an interest in history. It's just whether they're being told history in an interesting way, because at the end of the day, history is just all stories and humans love stories, but unless they're presented in an interesting, engaging way, it's easy to think that history is just a bunch of boring statistics and figures and dates. But yeah, from there, I just kept writing more articles and kind of diving into financial history further and merging my two passions for history and finance. And because I was lucky enough that there was kind of no one solely focusing on this outside of academia, I kind of just carved this niche and have developed it further into a website, a newsletter, as you uh, mentioned, which now goes to, I think, 11,000 subscribers each week. Um, and the InvestorAmnesia.com website has all of those newsletter posts and articles I've written. And then the most recent kind of new history venture has been this course that you mentioned your shareholders will be getting free access to, where I brought in a combination of academics, but also kind of legendary investors like Jim Chanos, who's also a huge history nerd and teaches a financial history course at Yale. And then they each gave a lecture on some topic related to the theme of the course, which is bubbles, manias, and fraud, which is always the most fun and sexy kind of aspect of financial history. So it's been a wild ride, um, especially this week with all the GameStop stuff going on. There's been a lot uh, a lot more interest in history and people looking back to see what kind of corners and short squeezes and other kind of moments of madness there have been in history. But whether everyone is looking for historical parallels or not, I'll be serving them up <laughs> because it's what my passion is. But it's nice when people are looking for his hit kind of lessons from history. And it's been definitely interesting the last year or so with everything that's going on and the phrase unprecedented times is probably the most used phrase of 2020 that um, everyone's looking to history to see if these are in fact unprecedented times where there are some examples from history we can learn from. 
Yeah, no, that, that's that's great, Jamie. I mean, that, that's one thing I've always had an interest in, and I think you seem to have a framework or a way of looking at these things. And maybe this will get in a little bit into your presentation of how to really, you know, use history. I'm sure there's ways that people have used it correctly, and people ways that people have used it incorrectly. Or and maybe you can get into some of that that aspect of um, of history and how you you've seen it be useful in the investment processes and how you use it as a as an investor and market participant. Yeah, definitely. So this is the perfect slide, perfect segue. So thank you, Keith. Um, I think that there are kind of two ways that you can view history as a tool and kind of your investor toolkit. The way that history should not be applied is thinking, you know, if I read this example from history about something that's loosely related to what's happening today in markets, then I will know exactly what's going to happen next. Like, oh, this stock did this after a seemingly related event 30 years ago. And so that's how that stock's going to react to whatever event's going on today. It's not, the analogy I use is that history is not a roadmap where it's not like a perfect GPS system where if you know what happened in the past and how previously something got from point A to point B, that doesn't mean if you think you're at point A today, you can just look at history for the exact route for getting to point B. But what it does do is it acts as a useful compass where you can directionally kind of point yourself or orient yourself in the right direction so that you're not at least facing the wrong direction. History does tend to repeat and there are patterns that play themselves out over and over throughout centuries. And so by identifying those trends, you can at least kind of put yourself in the right direction um, using history as kind of a compass. And then Jay, but, how, how have you done that, let's say, with some of the recent GameStop sort of short selling activity? How, how would you have you used this sort of approach to take a look at that particular sort of interesting, interesting, I guess, event that's happening now in the markets? So I work for a quantitative long only equity firm. And so we don't you know, react to any of this kind of short term stuff. Um, everything we do is factor based and based off models. So. I don't do anything specifically or we as a firm in reaction to something like this, but I do think that just in general, when these types of events occur, being a kind of student of history, it makes it a lot easier to not get swept up in what often turns out to be a short term event. While in the moment, it might seem like this is going to change things forever or have a massive lasting impact. If you look through history and all the crazy events that have occurred, most of which we don't even remember because they're such a fleeting kind of moment, but they seem really impactful at the time. It's just easier to kind of take a step back and view things within a broader context and know that the, you know, rhetoric of the day and people maybe saying how disruptive some event or action is going to be in the long term, it usually isn't. And the same goes for bubbles and manias when some new exciting technology is going to change everything forever. Doesn't mean it's not an exciting technology, but more than often than not, it doesn't change everything. What are some historical observations you've had of short squeezes that have happened in the past? It, it re I guess it really, really hasn't been that many in the recent past, but what are some of the observations you have on that versus like GameStop, which seems to be somewhat of a, you know, at least for recent market participants, it's a, it's a new phenomenon. Yeah, what's crazy to me is, I was just speaking with someone about this earlier, is that, you know, some people have made the, um, kind of parallels or sought parallels to the kind of robber baron era and gilded age where you had Jay Gould, Daniel Drew, and all those types of characters and Vanderbilt mm -hmm. involved in pumping and dumping stocks. And what's crazy about that time period is that more, not more often than not, but a lot of times, too many times, the people that were shorting these companies and trying to orchestrate a um, short squeeze or manipulate stock price were actually the directors of the companies whose stock was being shorted. Um, I think it was George Hudson in the UK during the British railway mania. He was taking money out of the companies like treasury out of the coffers and using that to manipulate the own, like his own company stock price. And I think Daniel Drew and Jay Gould, well, I know Jay Gould um, in the, I think 70s and 80s, 1870s and 1880s in America, he was also taking money out of the companies that he was a director at in order to short the stock price and kind of create pump and dump schemes. Um, so those are some interesting kind of aspects of short selling and short squeezes that we definitely don't have today. If we did, that would be 
that would be transformative, I think. <laughs> but I think my favorite short squeeze story is from the founder of Nomura Securities in 1905, where he had invested and made a killing on the long side in a bull market. But then he looked at other markets around the world and realized that it was overvalued, Japanese stock market was. And so he just quickly sold all of his longs at a massive profit and then plowed them all back into a massive short bet on the market. And for months he was wrong and he was hiding under his desk. He wrote about hiding as his creditors came in, like demanding margin calls. And he had to hire like a private rickshaw to go around the city side streets so no one could track his movements and see that he was about and come demand their money back. And eventually he pledged basically everything he owned to a friend of his who ran a bank in order to get a loan. But his friend was saying, you are clearly wrong. Like you're not, <laughs> you're, you're wrong. You're on, everyone else is making money and they're long and you're the only person hemorrhaging cash and you're short. So you should, I'm like not going to give you this money, but the Nomura founder convinced him. And then a little bit later, the market eventually um, went the way he expected it to. And over like three months, I think the stock market fell 88%. So he eventually made a killing, but it just, to me, it's a lesson and you got to have real kind of <laughs> conviction in what you're doing if you're going to start sh shorting stocks and realizing that you could lose a lot of money and almost lose everything. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the interesting things that it seems, at least some observations about this new, new thing going on with GameStop is that it appears that a lot of this was sort of coordinated versus on, with online websites like Reddit and some of these other communities, everybody, you know, working as a group, as a community, as opposed to I mean, some of the historical stuff are, I don't know, maybe you could write some history. Has that, have people historically, networkers have been among smaller groups, guys that had a lot of money that did it? This one seems to be more distributed around in regards to the number of participants that are involved with this particular short Swedes. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of examples from history, like almost too many to give you a specific, just because of the nature of how markets used to operate, how they're just crowds of people at the exchange or outside on the streets trading on the curb exchange but there were definitely pools of operators and if you read like these old books they're always talking about pools of operators moving the markets where they were acting and um co like coercively moving the market as a cohesive kind of unit um so that's definitely nothing new it's new that it's happening on a you know reddit <laughs> reddit community page but um the the concept of people combining and like coercively moving markets as one kind of group is definitely very old. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, of the history, and the, what have you found to be some of the best sources of financial history? And um, um, so, so a lot of it is, about. yeah, and um, the National Bureau of Economic Research, nber.org, they have a lot of papers in general, they're not all financial history, but mm -hmm. I would say most of the papers I include in my Sunday reads, which is a weekly roundup of five financial history articles and like a summary of why they're important, all unified around one theme um, from the markets that week. They're almost all from that site and SSRN, which I don't know what the acronym stands for there, but it's a, just another site with tens of thousands of academic papers and they're almost mm -hmm. I would say the vast majority of them are free to access. Um, but there, and then for archival sources, archive.org is an unbelievable um, kind of treasure trove. They have digitized books from as far back as the 1600s, and you can search them by keyword. Um, so for a history nerd, it's like a little gold mine in paradise because you can just read digitized versions of books that are written about stock markets in 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. Um, mm -hmm. And the Economist Archive is a great resource as well. That one you have to pay for though, but you can but keyword search and search all the text of every issue dating back to 1843, which is kind of like a superpower. <laughs> now, now what, are, what are ways you've seen history being used in either the idea generation and or idea sort of refinement process in terms of how investors have used history, you know, from that. I know you guys are a quant firm, but I'm sure you've probably observed investors or probably talked with people that have sort of used some of these historical data and, and stories, in other words, to basically help them become better investors. 
yeah, so I know, like, I don't want to speak for him, but he talks about it um, somewhat in the course, but having also given a guest lecture for his course and seen the syllabus, I know that Jim Chanos, he, his class at Yale is all about using financial history instead of just something that's like interesting and fun to talk about, but using it to develop sort of an analytical framework where you can look back and see what are the commonalities between all these examples of fraud um, and mismanagement by the legacy of famous companies like Enron, et cetera, but also way further back. What are the common unifying themes among all of them? So that you can then kind of apply that view and framework to the modern day and see when I like, check the boxes of what companies are exhibiting these kind of characteristics. And you can kind of systematically do that by using history and looking at past examples of fraud. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what are some of the big themes you see today in terms of how they're similar to, let's say, times in the past, like maybe some, some of the technological innovations and those types of things? What are some of the big sort of overarching, I guess, investment themes today that you see echo with the past? Or, of course, they're not going to be the same, but there's probably some parallels and maybe of interest to folks that are interested in trying to to see how these trends may play out over time. Yeah, so there's two that I've seen kind of play out to some degree this year. And the first is this concept of speculation and innovation, where you will see usually in history and this year, more so earlier in the year or last year, I guess, keep forgetting it's 2021, um, there was the crazy kind of skyrocket in Tesla's share price. And then it was followed by an explosion in EV SPACs or IPOs, or even just booming stock prices of already existing EV companies because retail investors and other institutional investors had seen how much money was made in Tesla. And so once that happens in history, this plays out dozens of times where there's one kind of company that dominates with a new exciting technology, usually it's technology or innovation. And there's a lot of money made in that one company. And then when people see that, they wanna replicate that success elsewhere. Then you kind of have this merging of, what they call, used to call promoters, like company promoters who will then start up new companies related to that to kind of try and capitalize on the moment and interest. But then also you'll have a sea of very uh, hungry speculators willing to hand over their money in hopes of replicating the success of that initial company. So what Warren Buffett has called the three eyes, that kind of progression that sums it up better is you have the innovators, the imitators, and then the idiots. And the idiots kind of ruin it for everybody. And the idiots usually turn out to be some example of fraud or fraudulent companies. And so usually it plays out in a slightly longer time period. But this year you see Tesla, and then you have the crazy share price moves in um, Nikola, which I think in their first quarter had $36,000 in revenues from solar panel installations on the chairman's ranch. And so they didn't even have like any real revenues or product, but still their stock price had soared like 80%, I think, since they IPO'd through a SPAC. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we know how that played out though with the uh, chairman stepping down and SEC getting involved. And so that was like a quick example of the cycle between innovator imitator idiot and it was even kind of more perfect because the imitator's name was the other half of the original company's real name via tesla and nikola um so it was really quite the imitator but um so that's one interesting example and you see that through history there are a couple of examples i have here where in the 17th century there's a tech bubble where a kind of treasure hunter found he formed a joint stock company and he had a group of investors backing his voyage to go try and find this treasure. And he ended up finding it. And it was like something like 32 tons of treasure that he hauled up from the ocean floor when he had actually found this sunken treasure ship. And when he got back, his investors received a 10,000% return. And so obviously other people saw this and thought, well, that looks awesome. Like I want to find the next, you know, successful treasure hunter. And so what happened is you had an explosion in diving technology, technology in air quotes, companies where there are these people that put together these companies like you can see on the left that were named things very creatively named the company owning the diving engine invented by John Tyrek, you know, very straightforward. Um, but you can see on the right that some of these like examples of, they call them diving bells. And 
basically the simple thesis was that if you can spend more time on the ocean floor, that gives you a greater probability of finding treasure, even though none mm -hmm. of these companies ever found any treasure or replicated um, the, the original treasure hunter William Phipps success. But you can see down here that the explosion in number of patents after the successful treasure hunt, I mean, 17 patents filed in two years, I mean, it's, it's just a crazy jump. Um, and it's, it's an, like the London stock market into its first kind of tech uh, bubble boom, which is interesting because that was in the 1690s. And then we obviously know what happened 300 years later in the 1990s, with another mm -hmm. tech bubble. But you had a similar kind of craze with transportation like EV this year, but in this case, it was with bicycles where there's an exciting kind of group of innovations around the manufacturing of bicycles, which made them easier to manufacture, but also it kind of got rid of the ridiculous penny farthing frame where it was the massive front tire and tiny back tire. And that led to, I believe, 600, yeah, 671 bicycle companies going public in the span of two and a half years. And as you can see down here, again, it's like at a lag to the share price performance where, again, there's the initial movers who have great success and then people want to take advantage of that. And so new companies are launched. And you can see here the number of cycle share companies being reported in the news media. So just basically a good metric for how many companies there were and it is at a lag to the share price performance again it's just something that we see playing out over and over again through history and then the second i was just going to go to the, the technological revolutions um which i think i know we wanted to talk about sure i think that's very that's relevant the other, the other one yeah so this framework is from a professor named Carlota Perez, who I think is at Cornell, um, but I could be wrong about that. But she had a book and put together this framework called Technological Revolutions, where to sum it up kind of briefly, there's two phases after a boom in a technological innovation where you have the installation phase and then the deployment phase. And during the installation phase, you have the eruption um, stage where the new technological innovation bursts onto the scene and everyone is freaking out and excited about it and it's you know there's a lot of excitement and then there's the frenzy phase where that's usually where you start to see that kind of IPO mania and the decoupling of share prices um, from actual underlying business fundamentals and then usually there's a turning point which is initiated by a market crash and then following that the crash brings prices and kind of business fundamentals back into line with each other, back to kind of reality. And then following that, you have a deployment phase where that innovative technology, which was previously siloed in the sector that it originated from, is diffused across the broader economy um, and picked up by kind of all sectors. And so in the first stage, in the installation um, stage, that is where growth stocks just trounce value as one would probably expect but after the turning point throughout history we have seen a, at least in the last technological revolution that value goes on to really help perform in the second stage so the um the revolution that we looked at at osam we wrote a paper was the age of manufacturing which is the fourth technological revolution and you can see that in 1908 you have the model t the real kind of innovation of that day was the automobile and the combustion engine. And so when that first happened, um, the kind of manufacturing sector was the growth sector of the day. And so this was a huge innovation and those stocks rallied and everyone was excited about the automobile and how much of an impact that would have. Um, but it was kind of siloed in that one sector and the value stocks of that day were more uh, sectors like railroads and railroad industry, and those massively underperformed because the new trucks that were enabled by the combustion engine and that automobile technology, they had much better price points for shipping and transporting goods than railroads. And so railroads lost business and their stocks tanked. But then following the um, 1929 crash, over the next 14 years, and so forth, the railroads and other industries started to adopt the technology or use that technology to their advantage. So mm -hmm. 
even though it seems kind of unrelated, the automobile had a profound impact on industries like retail because suddenly people could drive to the store. So you could open brick and mortar retail. There was some stat about how Sears within, I think just like five years of opening retail center, like retail stores because of the automobile, their sales from in-store um, units outpaced their mail order catalog business, which was their legacy business um, within just a few years after the automobile was kind of really established and they started opening retail centers um, for people to shop at. And it also led to the rise of suburbia because people no longer had to live in cities or had to live near a train station to get to work because they could drive. And so after the turning point, after the crash, railroads, which had suffered a lot in the first kind of phase of this revolution, they adopted the diesel technology and went through what they called the dieselization phase. And from that point, while they had underperformed the market, I think like by 80%, it declined over the first 15 years. In the next 15 years, a lot of these stocks, like um, the one on the bottom right, Southern Railway, they went on to perform what I think they returned to 8,000% over the next 15 years. And so it's just very interesting to see. And the parallels we made is to today. And this is a little bit old because it was from last year. But again, I think that you're starting to see some of that play out today where you hear the phrase, every company is a software company, software is eating the world, whatever. But during the pandemic, a lot of these kind of legacy institutions and legacy brick and mortar retailers have had no choice but to adopt technology and expand their e-commerce presence because it's quite literally a case of, especially in the first part of the pandemic, no one was going to stores. So if you wanted to sell anything, you had to be able to sell it online or do curbside pickup. And so that forced a lot of these kind of more traditional businesses that might not have had meaningful e-commerce or internet presence um, adopt that. And so I think that we're going to see that coupled with what remote work will do, similar to how the automobile kind of re reduced geographical barriers. I think that the boom in remote work following the pandemic, and even now during the pandemic, will have interesting effects similar to how the automobile kind of disrupted and changed how industries like retail operated. Well, it's going to be interesting, I think, to see what happens with like restaurants too, right? I mean, originally... yeah back into probably, you know, before the industrial revolution, a lot of manufacturing, people made food at home. They really didn't go out. The mobility allowed people to go out and they build this whole industry of retail outlets. And something some, something's happened here too now with a lot of these delivery services in terms of jumping on the, in the internet age of how these mainline businesses over time have been able to adopt these innovations and then from what I've observed is that, is that a lot of those companies that adopt the innovation, they have customers, they have the customers already. So their customer acquisition cost is very low compared to disruptors that are coming in and trying to disrupt the market. So they have a huge advantage of basically just be having the customer. It's just a question of will, how much of the innovation can they adopt or will they adopt? And if they yeah. adopt, they have a huge advantage over disruptive incumbents. But it's interesting today, from at least what I've observed, is that the way the market values disruptors versus incumbents, there seems to be a large difference. And I'm not sure, I mean, according to this framework, it looks like over time that may more equalize out as more of these incumbents incorporate these innovations into their ways of doing business. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, some of the kind of early examples we've seen is retailers like Target, which I think that Target, Kroger, I mean, that's grocery, but still, I guess, retail, um, Best mm -hmm. Buy, their sales, e-commerce sales year over year during the second quarter and third quarter were all above 100%, I believe, in each quarter um, for each of the three companies. And even my girlfriend and I went to a Target the other day for something, and we were kind of blown away by how nice Target is now on the inside and how, I don't know, it, it didn't feel like you were in a target. And it's just interesting to see how these companies are kind of recognizing trends better, but also the curbside pickup and e-commerce has just like exploded. It's no longer you have to go to Amazon if you want something fast. There are a lot of better, um, not better, but equally good, if not only slightly worse um, kind of e-commerce options for getting products that you're seeking. And so it'll be interesting to see how that increased competition plays out for these legacy retailers.
Well, one of the challenges for retailers and I think even even restaurants is the is the distance challenge, right? I mean, you you're an e-commerce and on on online person, you're sort of tied to some kind of delivery mechanism. One thing I've seen with some retailers is they actually are using their stores as basically places of you know forward distribution points because they're a lot closer to the customer than a lot of other types of. So, for example, Amazon has to either pay someone to deliver it or they have to develop their own network, right? Versus, let's yeah. say, another person that, that that has local stores, they can deliver it or you can go pick it up. Depending, so there's a it's an interesting aspect that I think of that business that we'll sort of see how that evolves. But that's a that's a, that's interesting. I think the analogy to to the age of manufacturing is, is really interesting to sort of see how that what played out there and then what could that mean today in terms of some of these businesses. But okay, yeah, I think also I mean you just look at things like the housing market, how areas outside of the kind of coastal cities are starting to explode. And that's, again, a direct cause of remote work because people no longer mm -hmm. have to be in New York or San Francisco, wherever. And definitely for families, for you know, prof working professionals who have kids and need to have space in order to do two full-time jobs remotely, plus having kids at home trying to do distance learning like that's a lot of zoom calls going on simultaneously so it's just a very simple you need more space and you move out of the city and you don't have to be in the city anymore for work and so it's just interesting how that's one already clear sign of what's to come with the impact of um remote work well yeah i mean i noticed that even here in right even in rochester i mean the housing prices here have probably gone up you know 20 percent over the past year they they have gone up percent in 50 years in Rochester. You know? I mean, yeah. it's, it's these smaller, I mean, we in Rochester are one of the smaller communities. I think that's, you know, it's really added an interesting aspect to that and just the whole, the remote work and how that's really going to play out. But yeah, that's 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 very interesting. One, one question I had in terms of some of these these bubbles and, and, the, and these concepts here, are there any advantages to bubbles or are they all destructive? I mean, most people's stories you hear about the excesses and how they're really bad. Are there any advantages over time of some of these bubbles in terms of what they provided for for you know the, the economy and other companies in general? Yeah, definitely. So if you go back to that original framework I had up, which is for some reason, there you go. The kind of that there's that phase of the decoupling and then the crash is what brings them back together there we go mm -hmm. and after the crash that's where the, the bubble kind of pops and explodes and there's chaos but in the deployment phase that's again where you have these value kind of legacy companies coming in to adopt the ground and build upon the framework that was laid in the first part which was the they call it creative destruction phase and then there's the creative construction but there's that groundwork that's being laid in order to kind of be built upon after the crash. Obviously, that's not the intent during the first stage. Yeah. People want to avoid the crash. You can look at something like the railroads in the 19th century, where there were definitely no shortage of multiple railway manias. But in the end, we still had suddenly a railway network around the country. Um, so that was built during the bubble. With the internet, there was you know the kind of infrastructure for online in a whole new world um, of internet and software and even though that was a bubble still kind of i don't know from the from the ashes the stronger companies like remain and grow from there like an amazon but um mm -hmm. even still there's still that kind of underlying foundation that has been laid during the formation of a bubble sometimes a bubble is just a bubble but sometimes there's a kind of lasting effect or lasting foundations that can be built upon following the crash. What happens if, how, how does leverage in the banking system get involved with this and how does that affect what, what really goes on with bubbles from that perspective? We've sort of, we haven't specifically talked about that, but can you describe a little bit what happens when, when the banking system gets involved with these types of bubbles? Yeah, um, definitely does not end well <laughs> normally. Um, the way that kind of, I don't know, just a random bubble where, I mean, it's one of my pet peeves because it's not as scary as everyone talks about it, but like the Tula bubble, you know, that crash, one of the things about that was one of the misconceptions is that the Tula bubble 
and it quotes crash like you know destroyed the dutch economy or didn't why would it <laughs> it's just some people trading in dutch tulip bubbles or dutch tulip bulbs and so when you have bubbles that are really kind of detrimental to society as a whole is when the banking sector is heavily involved and heavily exposed to the companies involved with those bubbles so that when those companies collapse it's not isolated to just those companies collapsing it goes on to the banks that are potentially highly levered and highly exposed to that company and so when they fail it spreads to the banks and then spreads across to the broader economy afterwards now i think we've seen that in 2008 do you see as much bank or leverage speculation in the current the current markets where we are today um i don't i'm not an expert on that but i feel like there's definitely such an emphasis on trying to prevent that from happening again that following 2008 that it's going to be more difficult not impossible obviously just just look at history um but i think that there is a more focused effort to try and reduce some of the chaos that went on in 2008 but i'm definitely not an expert and not as knowledgeable on those specifics one observation i think people have made is that maybe that's why the recovery happened so quick coming out of the pandemic is that there before then there wasn't a whole lot of interconnections in 2008 it took a long time for stuff to recover because it, as you say if the, the banking system are involved you basically have people in unrelated industries that are affected by the financial speculation that's happening there but yeah okay yeah. Another interesting theme is is basically narratives. You talked about narratives and stories um, as being as being one, one of the key things there. Have narratives always had a place in bubbles, or has it been variable? Or what, what, how how have narratives and bubbles sort of been been linked? Have there been, been cases where there's been bubbles where there's been no narratives, or more dispersed narratives, or what, what's what's the what's I'd been? I'd be your... hard pressed to think of a bubble that didn't have some sort of narrative around it because i feel like that's what gives kind of air to the bubble is mm -hmm. people getting overexcited about the prospect of something whatever the technology or innovation is and so inherently there kind of has to be some narrative around why it's exciting so mm -hmm. whether it's those diving technology companies the narrative was if we can come up with this great technology we can you know find all the world's treasures on the ocean floor there's something there's some kernel which gets built upon that leads to the kind of bubble because people overestimate what the future prospects of a company are because they're too excited about a new innovation or technology um, invention mm -hmm. how do you know i mean this is probably getting to a bigger question is is bubbles are really easy to see in retrospect but are there ways that you've been able to find or have you heard about or seen other people try to determine if a bubble is happening real time so i'm going to cheat and use the framework developed by professor john turner and his colleague william quinn who just wrote a fantastic book called boom and bust um, which is all about the history of bubbles and they came up with what they call the bubble triangle where mm -hmm. i'm going to try and remember the three sides without having it on hand but essentially there's the fire triangle which they use to just apply that framework to markets where in order for a fire to kind of really do damage, you have to have I think it's oxygen, fuel, and like the initial spark. I'm probably getting it wrong, but for markets, I think the three they had were you have to have marketability. And by that, they don't mean like marketing, but the ability to trade shares easily and kind of reduce friction. And then you need to have an innovation or something prompting it. And then, there's a third side which I oh um, I think I think credit. it's leverage and then if you have those three then they often lead not every time but lead to bubbles and so when you have those three I would say that's a good time to be on the lookout for what might be happening in markets because um, I think that framework when you look at most major bubbles in history has had all three sides checked off yeah I know that 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 is a great book we sent that to our shareholders for their Oh, Christmas perfect. Christmas gift this year, but that's a and and I, and John's actually I think one of the speakers in your course, right? Also, yes, he is. Um, he did a great lecture on the uh, the brewery bubble of the 1890s, and he also touched upon the bicycle mania that I uh, referenced earlier. But yeah, the brewery bubble followed the 
IPO of Guinness um, in I think 1886 or 1888, and it did fantastically well. And from there, I don't remember the number of companies, but again, there's an explosion in the amount of um, UK brewers that went to IPO on the public markets. Um, so it's a lesser known but fascinating bubble. But it's interesting. I mean, the one thing interesting thing I found about that bubble is a lot of it had to do with an industry that wasn't necessarily growing initially it was growing really big but then the growth rates were more modest and yeah I don't know, that's the probably in terms of bubbles are bubbles always associated with high growth industry i guess they're not but it just seems like it's an interest you know bubbles can happen amongst all types of companies right now i guess what we see in front of us are a bunch of high growth companies in bubbles but i'm sure there's lower growth companies that have sort of gotten into those types of you know speculative frenzies also yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I think exactly. You kind of answered it with the brewery bubble example. It's a great one. Um, and that was interesting because the influencing factors there were things like the temperance movement, where basically a lot of these kind of brewer um, management teams were kind of trying to go public in, in order to kind of cash out or <laughs> yeah, kind of have an exit of sorts for themselves because they could see the writing on the wall to an extent um, and the temperance movement and people were drinking less and then there are other factors at play but yeah it was an interesting where it wasn't necessarily because of such a high growth industry that that's what led to the bubble so in in the course that you have there um what are some of the uh you, you mentioned the the brewery the, the brewery bubble what are some of the other examples of psychological and sort of narrative errors that people have made that are sort of illustrated in your course? So, I mean, I would say that basically every lecture ties back to one of those themes. Um, mm -hmm. But a couple of interesting examples is, so I mentioned Jim Chanos does a lecture and he, his lecture is called Greatest Hits and it's 25 years of instances of uh, US corporate fraud. And he's basically walking through from his first ever short of Baldwin United and I believe 1983 to mm -hmm. up through the financial crisis he kind of walks through case study by case study of each company that people recognize but some also that i had no familiarity with just because i'm younger and i wasn't around when some of these companies existed but he walks mm -hmm. through just every kind of case where why he kind of started thinking about this company and diving in further and why what he calls what the what the bezel was what the kind of kernel of fraud was and why he got interested what the fraud was and how it played out but you see again these kind of repeating themes of how management teams are kind of stretching the truth or manipulating earnings to give off the impression of something that is far from reality so that that's a fascinating example and then you also have william getzman who's kind of the godfather of financial history. He's a professor at Yale. We talk about mm -hmm. the South Sea bubble at length, and he just points out a lot of similarities to kind of psycho psychological shortcomings today where people, even the reality was that with the South Sea company, they had only purchased the right to trade in the territory that the UK government granted them the rights to trade in for like, I think something like one journey a year. So it wasn't even like, <laughs> it was ridiculous that the share price moved highly at all because the business itself was awful. Um, but again, it was just kind of investors ignoring reality because they just kept seeing the stock price go up. Um, and so, yeah, there's no, everything is human nature and people just trying to chase returns despite what the realistic kind of outcomes are going to be. Now the South Sea bubble brings up another interesting aspect of some of these especially these early bubbles is the government involvement in regards to is, was that one in the mississippi bubble you could exchange government debt for these equity securities um how often has that happened over time in terms of bubbles of governments getting involved either directly or indirectly in many of these uh situations yeah that was definitely a very interesting case and what was really interesting about it is the Mississippi company, the Mississippi bubble happened towards, like, I think, more the end of 1719 going into 1720. And as you mentioned, it was a scheme where basically John Law was trying to help the French government reduce their debt load after, I think it was the Nine Years' War. Mm -hmm. And um, so the scheme was you can convert your bonds for equity in this new kind of quasi-government 
listed like publicly listed stock and the british were laughing as the bubble blew up at the french thinking saying you know the french are so stupid how could they do something like this like this is destined to fail and then six months later they did the exact same scheme <laughs> in the uk and so that's a kind of perfect example of human nature how we don't learn from mistakes even within that short a time frame i would say over time there hasn't been as many cases of that kind of just direct involvement where the government is trying to get people to buy a public stock that they also have ownership in. But in the US, you had things like the Credit Mobilier scandal in the 1860s, which I don't know all the details of. It's been a while since I read about it, but that was another sketchy example of railroad deals and government involvement where the government was kind of doing some backroom deals. And I don't know, I'm sure today there'd be some listeners who would start going on about the Fed and how the Fed is <laughs> fuel in the market today, but I don't think you can really put that in the same category. But yeah, the South Sea and Mississippi company bubbles were definitely some very stark examples of government involvement because a lot of the um, kind of MPs in Britain were like also acting as directors of the company or major shareholders. And it was a, mm -hmm. it was a mess. You have a similar thing today, right? With a lot of Congress people basically owning stock in various companies clearly it happens in real estate where they they can actually be investors in these real estate developments where they're what the legislation they're passing can help you yeah. know increase the value and i think a number of people in congress have gotten rich by basically being probably how probably helping i'm sure there was some rational reason for it but i'm sure they can put their hands on the scale to make things go one way or the other and that's why yeah. lobbyists are there to try and do that it's <laughs> it's interesting just the just right now, even a lot of the Congress people do have a lot of stock in companies yeah. that the legislation is they, they can actually have an impact on on you know the the values and the, the outcomes for these businesses. It's it's I mean I was surprised that there wasn't at this point at least some kind of a prohibition for members of Congress. I mean I think in the administration, if you're, if you're working for I think the administration, there's some certain things where people have to put stuff like in in separate trusts and they put them in yeah. in congress there's none of that at all which is surprising i mean maybe that's yeah, it is that, very strange yeah if we take a look at, at at the course itself what are some of the sort of unique views do you think that some investors will get going through that versus maybe some stuff they haven't necessarily been exposed to in terms of what are ways that that specific ways you think investors could improve their process or the way they do investing by by knowing the information that's in your course or seeing some of those examples? I think um, that definitely it'll be very, you'll get kind of a stark presentation and it'll be clear to you the trends and patterns that repeat themselves throughout history because you'll see by watching the lectures how much of them link together. But also within mm -hmm. each lecture, these are like the top experts in financial history and they are within even their whatever time frame they're covering showing you how this is playing out. And I think it's just, we've already alluded to it a few times today, where a lot of the bubbles we've talked about have come after wars where governments lowered rates because they needed to lower their own kind of debt burden to pay off this massive amount of government debt that they have to finance their wars. And that has almost always led to an explosion in speculative and risky behavior and the explosion in new companies to take advantage of that. And it's just a very noticeable pattern over history. And you can then also learn about things like these technological revolutions where you can look at, okay, values underperformed for however many years now. And people always say that's never happened before in history. But looking at this period in history, the fourth technological revolution, you see that actually there was another period where value stocks underperformed growth for 15 years. And so you kind of, I don't know, pull the wool back a little bit, mm -hmm. for lack of a better phrase, but you can kind of see these things that you may not otherwise learn about. Um, and I think it just gives you a better sense of how repeatable human behavior is. And as my boss likes to say, arbitrage in human nature is the last arbitrage because mm -hmm. markets change and people change, but our propendency to do stupid things does not change no matter what century you're in and we make the same mistakes time and time again and so just noticing what those mistakes are throughout centuries makes it easier to identify them in real time and kind of either sidestep them and don't get involved or figure out a way to take advantage of them because you know that it's going to happen so like for us as quants we know that we're 
just biased as humans and we make mistakes. And so the solution at OSAN was take the human element out of the equation because it's easy for anyone to get swept away by stocks. I mean, when I first got into markets, one of the first stocks I bought was uh, Movie Pass. So like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, it just, this applies to me as well because for like the first four days I bought it, it was going up like 60% every day. I was like, this is a genius. The guy who's running it was involved at Netflix. He knows what he's doing. He was at like Redbox. Like this guy knows movie business. Obviously, that's at like a penny a share now, but <laughs> it's just easy for anyone to get involved in kind of speculative. Uh, manias on the returns are good so stepping back a little bit what is the genesis or origin story of this course so through this kind of niche that i've carved out for financial history um mm -hmm. it's been interesting where because these papers i'm sharing each week in my sunday newsletter are academic papers primarily mm -hmm. i kind of oftentimes without knowing have had this new following of actual people in academia studying financial history and I've gotten to know them a lot better people like John Turner because I'll include their work in my Sunday reads and I'll share it on Twitter or LinkedIn and then I'll have that person who wrote one of the articles respond and say like oh I'd love to see like my thing included in here and so I've just kind of gotten to know these financial history professors and lecturers and mm -hmm. Pairing that with getting to know some really interesting people like Jim Chanos or Scott Nations, who's a CNBC contributor, but also wrote a really good book that might have behind me. Um, yeah, this one. He wrote this book, A History of the United States and Five Crashes, which goes from 1907 through the flash crash. And it's really good history. Got to know him. I thought, you know, I know all these kind of professors who are subject matter experts, but also kind of practitioners and actual investors who have a huge passion like me for financial history. I'm not an expert, but I think I'm somewhat good at aggregating information. And so mm -hmm. I, if I can bring them all into one course where they can each talk about something they're an expert in, I think it'll be of a lot of value to people who maybe aren't as passionate as me and don't want to spend the, the hours going through archives, but instead just have it presented in a very interesting lecture format where you can have access to some of the sharpest minds in the world and most knowledgeable experts on financial history teach you what you need to know. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. I mean, I, going through the course, it's a great compilation, like you're saying, especially for people that the amount of hours that it would take to collect all that information and put it together and you having you know access and have been exposed to a lot of those folks being able to weed through the you know a lot of the stuff that's sort of you know it's it's interesting but it may not be as relevant to investors i think it's an important sort of aspect of being able to do that um how much of your time do you feel you're going to, that you find something really good versus sort of sifting through a lot of stuff that that turns out not to be good in the end not as good in, in the end in terms of uh in terms of the data that's out there yeah, there's, it's kind of a hard question to answer because I just in general really enjoy reading history, whether or not I find the kind of nugget I'm looking for or not. But yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of hours that I've spent searching for, like I know what I'm looking for because of whatever's happening in like markets that week or today. And I'm trying to find, like this week is a perfect example, the amount of people that have asked me, is there a precedent for a brokerage firm or some type of market maker shutting down one side of a trade like what happened with GameStop. And so mm -hmm. that's going to lead to me looking through a bunch of scholarly articles and archives because I'm interested to know the answer. And so there are some things like that where there are hours poured in and I never find that nugget that I'm looking for. But I'd say by and large, it's a pretty good split between kind of reading for enjoyment and reading for trying to find a nugget and actually finding it and it all works out and is worth it in the end. Okay. Appreciate you uh, you coming on to the value hour here, Jamie. What's the best way of getting, getting a hold of you? Yeah, so if you want to check out the website and subscribe to the newsletter, that's investoramnesia.com. And my Twitter handle is also at investoramnesia. And my email is jamie at investoramnesia.com. So, it's all fairly easy to remember. It's all investor amnesia. Um, but yeah, that would be the best place.
And then if you sign up for my newsletter and the welcome email, it gives more details on the course, but I think they're all getting access to it regardless um, after this. Okay. Now, now what, what's the origin story behind that investor amnesia? Is there anything specific behind that or is that more? It just kind of came together one time. It's like one of those shower thoughts where you're just kind of like, <laughs> I was looking for something succinct that, you know, summed up the idea that we never learn from our mistakes and in history. And so kind of amnesia and investors flowed together pretty well. And it gave off what I was trying to say where investor amnesia, we've been here before. Um, but whether we remember it or not is a different story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, well, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you so much.